Hello, everybody. My name is Peter Dorrington, and I'm going to be your moderator today. Um, now, whilst we wait for folks to complete logging in, um, firstly, let me welcome you to this webinar with SD Works today. Now, joining me today are our two experts. I'm going to get them to introduce themselves in a moment, but we've got uh, Mandy Hawley and Devyani Bashan Payan. So, welcome to you both. Um, Mandy, if you wouldn't mind, could I ask you, could you just do a brief introduction for us, please? Mandy, you're on mute. Apologies. Can you hear me now? Perfectly, <laughs> thank you. Hi, I'm Mandy Hawley. I'm the Channel and Partnership Director for UK and Ireland for SD Works. Um, and I've been in the HR and payroll industry for over 20 years and working with some of the biggest companies from a retail, hospitality and many other industries perspective. Um, I mean, it, as a European provider of people solutions and technology, um, we see constant change, uh, change in industry, technology, legislation, globalization, and of course the pandemic, and all have an impact on how businesses operate and how they need to be supported. Um, from a retail perspective, the huge and sustained move from bricks of mortar stores to online and e-commerce means that traditional retailers have very quickly had to make the move to be tech and distribution experts. Um, and I think these evolving business models and ecosystems require different technologies, collaboration, support from technology partners and suppliers. Um, and delivery models, technology, personalization, convenience, all the expectations of businesses and consumers actually now mirror the expectations of HR, payroll and employees. So we'll be looking at some of those things today and really the key to success around agility, scalability, speed and flexibility of businesses to be able to support. Great. Thanks very much, Mandy. Daviani, would you mind just introducing yourself as well, please? Sure, Peter. So um, I'm Deviani Vaishampayan. Um, I've worked as a, uh, I've had a 30 year career as a, a group HR director or a global HR director in large uh, international complex businesses. Um, also lived in the US and China and Singapore, so very international. Uh, what I do now is I'm the CEO of a human capital digital innovation hub. Now it sounds a bit of a mouthful, but actually it's very simple. Uh, we all know AI and digital is having a huge impact, not just on the business, but even on the workforce. But more importantly, I think it, it, it's very different from regular tech, but it also can feel a little bit scary, a little bit un, um, you know, of the unknown. So we help HR teams pilot an innovative AI solution around any aspect of people management. Uh, so, you know, we have a couple of hundred vetted solutions and the whole idea is you start with your people issue, we match the right solution and we help you program manage a three month pilot. So I guess, you know, I marry the world of corporates, HR and, and the issues they have with what's available out there in terms of AI and digital. Great. Thank you very much, Demiani. So quite a lot to talk about today. I'll just recap on some of that in a moment. But before I do, then let me just um, do a little bit of housekeeping. And because this is a webinar, the housekeeping will take about 30 seconds. So firstly, you don't need to worry about your camera being on or your microphone being off mute. It's a webinar. However, we do want to hear from you. So if you have any questions today at any time during our discussion, drop them into chat. I'll be looking at chat all the way through our conversation and I'll try and bring those questions to our group and we'll talk about them. So um, don't worry about cameras, don't worry about being on mute, but if you've got questions or you wanna make an observation, drop it into chat and we'll pick it up and talk about it. I will try to leave a little bit of room at the end in order to do that. Now, um, this webinar is being recorded, so don't worry too much about taking lots of detailed notes. We'll send you the instructions on how to play it back um, in the future shortly after we conclude. So it is being recorded. You will be able to go back over it and just uh, double check on some of the things we're going to talk about today. Now, Mandy did a very good introduction for us on the scene setter, but I just want to share with you some of the thoughts about um, what I've seen actually happening. Um, so obviously, the retail sector took a battering over the last couple of years. 
But I think that for many, it was an acceleration of trends and transformations that were already in progress. Nonetheless, coronavirus caused a lot of people to have to think, rethink their business, um, go where their customers are, and in some cases work differently as well. And we're going to explore the impact on things like payroll and how we um, employ staff and engagement with that area. So that was the first thing. There was an enormous amount of change. Um, we went through that very quickly. Most of our businesses have actually developed an appetite for it. So the change that they were brought in perhaps to accommodate shifts in the way that we sell are now being brought into the background and the way that we work. So we're going to focus on perhaps a little bit more about the background. And as Debiani said, one of the things that has really caught people's attention is as you go through the digital journey, as you start to get more data, you can apply things like AI. So you can begin to see the patterns of things that are normal and the things that aren't. So you can begin to identify where some of those changes may be. So we're going to explore the role of technology in supporting these wider functions. So how are we going to do this? Well, um, we're going to have a series of topics that Mandy and Deviani and I are going to talk through. We're also going to have a couple of polls. The first one will be coming up in a few minutes. So to find the poll, um, if you find the three dots on your menu and open it up, you'll see that there is a button there for polls. There won't be anything there at the moment that you can do, but at appropriate points, we will open that up and we will run a poll and um, click on the answer that's the best fit for you and then we'll talk about the results after 30 seconds or so. So let me start by firstly going to Mandy. So Mandy, how is uh, the retail evolution driving change in HR and payroll technology? So we've seen changes in other areas, but how's it affecting HR and payroll? Yeah, I mean, I think, Peter, you mentioned there some of the huge changes that have been in retail. Um, and as you say, I think a lot of these uh, changes would have happened eventually. They've just been sped up because of um, because of events in, in the economy. Um, and we're now in a world between lockdown and reopenings. Um, but some of that consumer behaviour has changed forever. Um, and I think it was certainly true that retailers with robust e-commerce sites um, and retailers that had modern technology were able to very quickly pivot their operations to respond to different uh, requirements. And I think that's led to a realization that this speed, flexibility and agility is also required in HR and payroll to support changing business models. Um, a digital business in a constantly changing environment, as, uh, if you look even at sort of, I live, as you can probably tell by the accent in Manchester, um, even if you just walk through the Trafford Centre, you can see so many changes in how retailers operate. So mergers, acquisitions, franchise models, hybrid working, globalisation, online, all of these bring different pressures on HR and payroll departments as to how to support that business. So in a, it, from an HR and payroll technology point of view and a service point of view as well, we're looking at different ways that that technology can support um, turnover, recruitment, what the war for talent, onboarding people much more quickly. And I think one of the real key things in that area also is data and insight. How do you very quickly get the right data to make the right decisions to pivot and change your business quickly? Great. Thank you very much, Mandy. Uh, some interesting points there, weren't there? So um, not only did we have the, say, the, the transformation in the way that the business operated, so the operating model had to shift to accommodate, firstly, um, the strictures of the pandemic, but now the way that people are living their lives differently. You also pointed out, um, as I think I heard you say, that, you know, some of the changes we saw over the last two years will stick but there are new and emerging behaviours, not only for shoppers, but the way that we work. I mean, it is clearly the case that you look at people and say, well, we do want perhaps some more flexibility or we want to be able to focus a little bit more on pay or benefits. And so we're looking at different ways in which we employ. And even in the height of the pandemic, we were still onboarding staff. We were transitioning staff from one type of role to another type of role as our business has changed as well. So lots of it were going on. A lot of that, I think, was initially focused on the direct customer or supplier facing systems. But we're going to have our first poll question now. And the poll question is this. Is your back office, brackets, employee technology, matching your front office, 
consumer technology. So I'm going to start that poll now. So the answers are completely, mostly, partially, not at all, or don't know. So is your back office employee technology matching your front office consumer technology? Go to the polls. Um, it's live now. Select the answer that is the best fit for you. So it doesn't have to be a perfect fit. So um, okay, we start seeing people coming in. We're going to let that run for a little while whilst we do. Mandy, let me just come back to you for, for this as a moment. You know, this is one of the things I think I mentioned. A lot of businesses saw how they could use things like cloud technologies, reinvigoration and transformation of some of their operating model systems um, and get very effective results. And I think some of them have started to cast the net a little bit wider, haven't they? They're beginning to look at, well, where else in our business do we have opportunities to transform the ways that we work? Um, so I, I just think that that was something that, as you said, I, I believe it's there, but I don't think we're fully there yet, are we? No, and um, I mean, I think um, a recent McKinsey study said that funding for digital initiatives had risen more than any other, um, quicker than any other funding initiative. And actually, sort of digital initiatives were actually taken off up to 20, 20 to 25 times, and in some instances, 40 times more quickly than other initiatives. Um, and that whole migration to cloud. I mean, we've been talking about migration to cloud, and I think it's interesting now that actually we're getting to second generation cloud purchases as well. People did move to cloud potentially 10 years ago, but with different objectives. Um, but I mean, from a front of house perspective, I mean, we even know it from being customers, let alone sort of working in a retail or HR and payroll environment. Um, there is a much more sustained uh, level of e-commerce. Then there's a new generation now of omni-channel uh, shoppers. And that expectation means that the expectation within our life is much, much higher. Consumers are employees as well. Um, and it can be quite damaging for employer brands if back office functions aren't meeting those requirements of, of consumer and front office functions. And many older legacy tech platforms, as I say, or even cloud technology platforms that were put in 10 years ago, can't necessarily support this. Um, I mean, payroll traditionally has been a function which is office based, um, which is and you have an ability to be able to go and speak to those people. And there's now a, there's now a demand for that to be well over COVID there was a demand for that to be sort of based at home hybrid work and we had so many organisations who just weren't able to have that infrastructure in place so there's that huge move but there's also a bigger employee demand so from a from an employee perspective there's a demand to be connected 24/7 365 days a year to have data at your fingertips. And actually to be, have a little more data and insight. Um, I mean, even if you look at self-servicing stores, even that's moved on and Amazon are now looking at stores with no checkouts and no lines and you'll be able to um, sort of camera technology will be able to see what you bought and charge it to you. And people are expecting now those things to come from an employee point of view. So I, I expect to be able to apply for my holidays when I want to book it and get an answer back straight away. If I've got a question on my payslip, I want to be able to either ring or chat or get that. And also sort of that piece around employee and financial well-being as well. Great, thank you very much, Mandy. So I'm going to draw the poll to a close now. Um, Wow. Well, this is quite interesting. So of the answers to the question, is your back office employee technology matching your front office technology? Nobody said completely. I don't think that would come as a surprise. 15% said mostly, 38% said partially, 38% said um, not at all, and um, seven um, don't know. And I think that's really uh, you know, quite an interesting um, topic. Let's explore that a bit more. So Deviani, let me come to you then. So thinking about that, so you know, what we've seen is well, nearly 80% saying that their back office systems either only partially or not at all match their front office technologies. I think that's going to say you know, now is the time for back office functions to catch up with those front of house consumer technology, isn't it? So you know, what do you think about that? Is, that? is this the argument we can make and say, well, actually, because of that distance, you know, as our experience as consumers is not matched by the experience we have as employees. Yeah, absolutely, Peter. So, firstly, you know, it it, it is uh, it it is quite uh, a big big uh, figure, isn't it, of people who kind of feel that there's there's a need to catch up. But I do think there are a couple of other trends which 
are going to change things quite rapidly. Um, and some of it, I think Mandy has alluded to, but if I were to recap, I think a lot of business models are now turning digital and particularly in the retail side. Now you can't have a business model that's digital, but then have an HR function that is still quite traditional. So the pressure on HR, uh, irrespective of what function is it, whether it's payroll, whether it's recruitment, it doesn't matter, is going to increase to try and adopt uh, you know, newer technology and make sure it's more fleet-footed and, and adapting to change. Uh, the second big pressure continues to be costs. And again, uh, you know, we know the retail sector has been hit quite badly, but uh, again, uh, consolidation, uh, pressure on margins means that you can't just rely on the technology you have. You have to consider how could you a become more productive, but also reduce costs. And the new emerging technologies are great at that. But to me, the biggest factor is going to be employee experience. I mean, there is no doubt. And when you say back office, people think, oh, that, does, that doesn't matter. It's the back end. Actually, it's a very, very big part of the input that goes to employees. And I think, again, uh, if I were to, uh, you know, what do you mean by employee experience? What are employees expecting? The first is personalization. I think employees increasingly saying it's not a one size fits all, whether it is, uh, you know, the way they get treated in the recruitment process, but right up to I mean, reward is a big, big part of keeping employees engaged, but also retaining them. And there, the whole experience is they have to ask for things. They, have, they get some standard replies. They're not able to plan ahead. But again, real time, anytime, anywhere. I think all those, if you're able to incorporate that, and most importantly, you're able to use your back office to have predictive analytics, not just historical. You look back and you analyze, but something that helps you looking forward given the pace of change that's going to happen. So there's a real opportunity here for back office now to play a much bigger role around the whole employee experience piece, but also help businesses reduce costs and become far more agile. Great. Thanks very much, Devyani. And um, yeah, a couple of things there you talked about. Yeah, yeah, obviously, the squeeze on costs that all of us are going through and you know, finding better ways to do it. Very difficult, as you said, to have a digital business with an analog back office behind it. You mentioned predictive analytics, and for me that's particularly interesting because many businesses are trying to make sense of what they think is going to happen in the future. And what because it's uncertain, I think many of them are saying, well, we have to keep going back to the data and reinterpreting the data, which is extremely difficult to do in an analog-based system. So it you know, just takes you so long to gather the data that by the time you've made a decision, circumstances have already changed. Um, now, Mandy, let me come to you. Same thing. You know, why is now the time to uh, make this change from back office systems to catch up with front of house one? So what are some of the things that you are seeing going on out there? Why are people making the change? Because after all, they're not going to do it just for fashion. No, and uh, I think that there's an older sort of more traditional and um, required reason. So sometimes things are end of life. So sometimes things don't work. Sometimes things are broken. Um, but all of the, some of the things that Bjorn mentioned there, and especially from a back office function, that there's now an ability to be, for um, HR and payroll to be um, to be actually anywhere. So regionalized shared services is one thing that we're seeing, and shared service functions can work in different ways. And um, HR and payroll technology needs to be able to support businesses to be able to make those those decisions. But also that move very much away from payroll was very traditionally a backward looking function. So you run the payroll on, uh, I mean, actually the, the last day of the month. So, you know, everybody's about to get paid tomorrow. And then the data you have will be next week to look at the data from the month previous. Um, so, and it's much more about looking forward. So what can we look at in terms of trends and how can HR and payroll a lot more support decisions of a business? So if we are going to close three stores, open a franchise within a department store and move a percentage of business online, what does the workforce need to look like to be able to support that? And what information and trend analysis can HR give to the business to be able to say what cost efficiencies they might be able to make? Do we actually have the talent pool required to be able to do that? Um, and how will we then roll out things like onboarding, training, manage time and make the workforce a lot more flexible? Um, and there are so many things then in terms of that. So like as employees move around the business, 
the the experience that they have whether they're working in the manchester store or the westfield store or whether they're crossing different departments they want the same experience and they want to be able to see the hours they've worked what they've earned and have a lot more flexibility um, and debbie already mentioned personalization huge sort of i'm uh well far the other side of 40 closer to 50 than i would like to imagine um, sort of more settled from a house owner point of view, have a selection of children knocking about at different ages. My requirements are very different than somebody who's stepping out of college or university and actually their, their income is disposable, they live at home. So we want very different experiences from HR and payroll and how we can interact with that department and what we can do with our money and salary. Okay. Thanks very much, Mandy. And you're right. Um, just like customer experience, it shouldn't be one vanilla experience um, that is offered to everybody that, you know, customers now expect degrees of personalization and customization so that they get some control over what they see and they um, uh, use. Employees, too, you know, as a, you know, they're also people. They're consumers as well, by the way. So they're constantly comparing us against the consumer experience. Just before I take a little bit further, one of the things I was interested in, perhaps you could um, give your opinion on this is uh, you know, payroll for I'm just going to look at payroll HR for a moment a lot of those systems are actually quite old and a lot of people say well we can't touch it because it's stable and we you know everything else in our business is up in the air but at least that is stable or what we're seeing is some of those older technologies are really coming out of life now aren't they they're getting to the end of their service life they're becoming very expensive to keep going I just wonder whether you've seen that as well as one of the issues that people have mentioned you know we, these older technology platforms, not all of them, are in, uh, really going to be able to support our transformation as a business. No, they're not. They're old and clunky and they're difficult to move and they're difficult to change. Um, and, you know, sort of it, even if you look sort of from a, from a front of house perspective, you know, cloud, API, that wider ecosystem, the ability to be able to integrate different technologies um, and get data from different places and always be on the latest version of things. We're all so used to being, um, well, Apple or Android, you go on, you press the button, everything updates, and you benefit from the latest features and functions. On old legacy mainframe tech, that's not possible. Um, it takes a long time to affect change. Um, so from that sort of legacy perspective, the benefits of being on latest tech are now huge. And from a business perspective, we're starting to see the business case for for that change being much more understood within businesses. Right, thanks, if I may add there, I think there's, there's also a, a few trends now which make the older technology, that it's not prepared. And, and, and so the first is really the gig economy. Increasingly, there are people now, it's not just having one job, but they could be working for two or three different companies for a shorter period of time. Uh, and, and I don't think uh, traditional payroll systems are geared for that. I think hybrid working is encouraging a lot of organizations to really look at where should jobs be, where should your supply skills be. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, the traditional way of being in the region or the country, for example. And that means there could be an international aspect which traditionally businesses may not have had to keep in mind. But equally, I think the emphasis on flexibility. So, for example, there are organizations which are now saying, Okay, you employee, nine months of the year, you need to be in location X in the UK, but three months of the year, you can choose to work from anywhere in the world if you want to. Now, again, all these are very evolving new trends, but they're catching on very fast. And again, if you want to have a competitive environment to track talent, your systems have to keep pace with it. Yeah, thanks very much, Daviani. New ways of working are demanding new ways of operating and particularly the systems that support them. Actually, let's explore that a little bit more. So, Mandy, I'm going to come back to you. You touched on this very briefly, but um, how have the ways that we pay and support our people changed in practice? So what has changed from their perspective and the way that we treat them as employers? Uh, and Debbie touched on it sort of hugely there in terms of that traditional payroll model really is becoming less and less fit for purpose um, and less and less understood by by sort of working individuals it doesn't fit with the way that they they want to live their life and actually from a business model perspective it's very restrictive um, you know if you are restricted paying an individual in a certain currency in a certain way that global mobility even internal mobility becomes very different but very difficult and it actually ends up restricting 
the way that you want to run your business. So I think sort of the, there's two ways to look at how we pay and support people. One is from a business perspective and how as a as an HR and payroll team or how as sort of a from, from a retail hospitality industry point of view, can we have a much more flexible workforce that makes it more agile, more cost effective, um, and enables us to upskill and cross-skill and share those skills around the business. Um, and payroll has to be able to support that. There are legislative impacts of it, there's global mobility impacts, um, the hybrid nature, um, there might be different working patterns or it might be needed to cut to cost it to different departments. I'm always really surprised at the amount of restrictions a business actually ends up coming under because of the way that the payroll is actually set up. Um, and it, it's ridiculous if you think about the fact that we're restricting a practice and the business could be more effective if the payroll was more flexible. So we're definitely seeing that side of things. And then we're also seeing it from an employee point of view, that whole point around flexibility and, and being agile and personal. Um, you know, sort of, is, is it actually appropriate anymore for an employee to have to wait till the last day of the month to get all of the hours that they've worked? You know, sort of somebody may work uh, overtime for a particular two weeks because they're going on holiday the week after. They want they want that money that they work for the overtime then, and that can be a real benefit to the business because it drives uptake of overtime because people see the impact. Um, and actually it allows people to manage their life and their money in the way that they, they actually want to. Some of that's actually going back in time. So 20 years ago, we paid a lot of people weekly. We moved to monthly and now we're looking at more flexible models. But I think sort of the big trend is more around, one around education. So I think there is um, a responsibility from a business point of view around education and financial well-being and emotional well-being for individuals but also in giving them the flexibility to be able to work and interact with the business the way that works for them. Great. Thanks very much, Mandy. Again, some great things. Some of the things I was hearing there were, you know, the match in people's expectations. But the big one is flexibility. That, you know, I guess that's the employee version of agility. They want that ability to actually say, well, I have different demands. You know, as the economy shifts, as my individual personal demands shift, I want to be able to get some flexibility. And I think it may be redrawing some of the lines between the relationship between employees and employers. Deviani, let me just bring you back in. So same question to you, really. Perhaps you, you have something you might want to add to that. You know, how has the way that we pay and support our people changed? And you know, perhaps some of the practical implications of that. Well, I guess I think um, Mandy and I have covered uh, most of this, but if I were to add a couple of things more, I think for retail businesses, um, you know, it's, it's and, and for many businesses in general, it's very clear that a lot of your traditional frontline staff, are those roles are getting automated. Equally, uh, the shift in roles is, is moving to skill sets that probably could be sourced, as I said, from anywhere. And so payroll systems have to now think about, about it slightly differently. Um, uh, and, and we'll come to technology uh, such as blockchain a little later. But when Mandy spoke about, you know, the, if you want to get paid as soon as you put in the hours, today there is technology that can help you around it. So I, I do think it's not enough to go by what has happened. I think HR and payroll managers now have to really, really think about some rapid changes that are happening and just pick up two or three, but ensure that the focus is on the employee, not just what's convenient for the organization. Great, thanks very much, Deviani. Um, yeah, so it's that flexibility, isn't it? The ability to deal with changes in their circumstances um, in the economy and so on. Now, Deviani, you mentioned a little earlier AI, and I know that that's a topic that's widely discussed in a number of fields in business. So let me just ask you this then. Do you see that um, AI and digital solutions in this space you know, are beginning to rise in prevalence? And what are some of the opportunities or potentially risks of using those kinds of solutions? So as we go digital, we get the opportunity to get more data. We can use AI and we can support automation. What are the automation? Uh, what are the opportunities and some of the risks, though? So uh, let me begin with saying I think AI still feels a little bit out there and futuristic. But the reality is 
all of us use AI in a big, big way, even in our daily lives. Whether you're driving a car, you know, you have the you know, Alexa, whether you want to find anything, I think it's really AI. So AI is nothing more than access to data, looking for patterns, but the ability to then interact in a very intuitive way uh, with the user to help them not just understand what they want, but what they also may not be, might need. And I think if you apply that, uh, as I said, you know, we work across all aspects of the employee life cycle and people think, and, and a big level of increase in feedback, coaching, mentoring, which yes, is a very human centric process, but which can be aided in a big way through the use of AI, AI solutions. But specifically coming to a payroll or reward, um, I think where we are seeing the use of AI is firstly, not just treating it as a processing, you know, a lot of technology currently is just been used to process stuff, process data, get some output. Whereas I think where we are seeing the users link it to your uh, market data, for example. So again, let's get back to retail. Let's say a retail business now realize, realizes that they have to pull in a lot more digital skills, which traditionally they've not had to do. Now, is there a quick way for them to understand where are the skills in the market, who's paying what, and therefore help shape the recruitment strategy around it. So there are solutions that can help you provide real-time data around it. Pay equity. A lot of current tech, or payroll tech is focused on analyzing information. And you get that. And six months later, one year later, you're still trying to put into place action plans. But if you had a solution that could help you in a real-time basis understand, is your action plan actually shifting the dial on what your gap is, that would be far more useful. Uh, a third example of, of, of payroll solutions is uh, Mandy referred to wellness. Now, wellness is a huge, huge opportunity area. So let's say you're a professional. If you had a great app-based solution that looks at what do you save, what do you spend, what are you spending on pensions, how could you use the company's reward benefits, and what impact does that have on the actual money that you have in your bank balance, but it's also linked to your actual bank balance. So again, on an ongoing real-time basis, you know exactly what your position is. Income protection is another area. I think a lot of retail uh, blue-collar workers clearly work on less hours and income protection is, 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 is really important from an organization perspective, but it's not easy to do that. If you had a solution that also grants privacy to the employee, because currently a big issue is, you know, they have to go and ask the organization, which often is not very um, palatable. But if they had the privacy to figure out and access it through an app and use it in a cost effective manner for the organization. I mean, these are just examples. I'm just saying, you know, there's lots of opportunities to plug in and look at what is your issue, bring some of these solutions in. And the great thing about many of these solutions is it's very easy to integrate. It's not like your traditional tech where you've got to have a big project rollout, put in a lot of money. These are very cheap. They are per employee, per month uh, basis. But also, the you know, often the integration is just via the email login. So uh, I guess what I'm saying is you just need to rethink now about using technology not to make a process more efficient, but really how do you solve an employee issue and provide a better experience. Great. Thanks very much, Deviani. And I think um, th there's an interesting lesson there as well, which I, I applies to a broader transformation agenda. If the only reason you're doing it is to reduce cost, you're probably missing an enormous opportunity. So but, um, as these systems have grown in sophistication and the insights they develop, they open up all kinds of avenues for exploration in terms of, well, how could we make it better? So um, you know, one of the things I think that many of us have seen is when people do a transformation program, it's not just lift and shift from one system into another system. It's an ideal opportunity to think about, well, what's the employee experience we offer? As you said, you know, we can offer more self-service and privacy at the same time. We can offer more flexibility, but also the business gets an ability to plan ahead, look at well, what is it that my employees really care about? How do we serve their needs? So Mandy, let me come back to you. So um, how do we go about connecting things like payroll and time management systems? Because I think for many executives in business, this just happens, doesn't it? You know, we, we work shifts, we record time, people get paid. What's so difficult about that? 
you would think. Um, I mean, even even in the last couple of weeks, sort of working with some of the biggest companies in the UK and some companies that you would think at the forefront of technology, if you're a consumer, will in their business be inputting one piece of data three times in three different systems. They'll be printing a piece of paper out from one system and walking across the store with it to put it into another system. And the amount of inefficiency in, in the business, and that doesn't even then go into the uh, potential for manual errors. Um, and actually, sort of from an employee job satisfaction point of view, we're, we're in a lot of ways getting line managers to be sort of skilled payroll professionals in a, in a lot of instances. Um, and there are some sort of huge inefficiencies in those areas. You mentioned sort of it must be easy to connect them. I think that the, the challenge that we're seeing is it's becoming more and more difficult to disconnect them. So if we look at quite often people will come to us and say payroll's broken. Um, yeah, either the system's old, it doesn't work, we're getting errors. And usually errors is sort of the, um, the trigger that says something needs to happen. But then when we sort of take it back um, a level, we could put a new system in and it would still be broken and we'd still get the same errors. It would just be shinier and quicker and look better. Um, I think sort of the really important thing to do in terms of payroll and time management is look at it from an end-to-end -end process. So look at all the people interactions, all the process interactions, and actually look at what business efficiencies we want to gain and where we actually want to make changes. For me, one of the biggest um, things to do in those situations is get the users involved. What are they doing that is wasting time? What are they doing that is not adding to their role? Where do they see the inefficiencies? Quite often you see managers responsible for maybe 30, 40 people within their department. Change of address, change of marital status, change of bank account details. All that should be pushed out and down the line to the individual who owns that data. Of course, through workflows, we can put in different checks. Um, but then integrating that data so that you can, and actually you can then start interacting with um, people before they start. So you can send them their onboarding data there two weeks before they join the organization and get them feeling good about the organization and get all the data. Um, and get that actually the skills in the right place you're able to analyze what skills are where in a lot of instances you have to have particular skill sets in particular departments um, but that huge move to be able to be just so much more flexible and so much more efficient in the operation great thanks very much mandy um yeah you mentioned there some of the skills are changing and i think this is one of the things that when we look at the adoption of automation and ai Hopefully it does take care of some of those routine things that are just at the moment are just crank a handle, spit out this month's payroll, or we are able to offer self-service to our employees. But does that mean that the skills that we need of our HR and payroll teams are changing? So let me ask Devyani this. What do you think are the skills and capabilities that the HR manager of the future is now going to need? So firstly, let me start by saying I do think feel for the HR function. Uh, the last couple of years have been very tough on, on, on HR managers. Uh, I think the pandemic, the speed of change, and, and now the whole move to a hybrid workplace, thinking about policies, but also being the guardian of employee engagement and business relying on them so heavily has been, of course, a great opportunity, but has also uh, you know, put, put additional pressure on limited time and budgets that they have. But equally, if I look, as I said, I think the word opportunity is, is really big. But it does mean, and, and I'm a big believer of three, if you just focus on three things and do that well, that could really make a difference. The first for me is, I, I you know, uh, think about connecting the dots and linking what you're doing to, actual, to some actual business issues. So let's say you're running payroll, that's fine. But if you are able to understand how could that improve your recruitment strategy, how is it going to impact retention? Uh, in terms of mental health and well-being, there's a great opportunity now to provide and support employees. Um, but equally, I think the whole employee experience piece, which is again getting very important. So, so join the dots, think strategically, and don't treat your role as a transactional role 
would be, uh, I think, the first uh, kind of piece of advice. Uh, but equally, uh, Peter, I think what it, you referred to it in terms of the word exploration, what it means is also going to mean a mind shift change. Uh, I do think no one knows the answers right now. If, if you, you ask any head of HR, uh, there will be very few who's, who's, who know exactly what needs to happen and how that's going to pan out. But you can't sit still. So I think the important thing is to explore, experiment, try out. Uh, and, and that means probably from a payroll perspective and even, even bigger mindset change because you know you can't in the past you couldn't afford to take a risk because mistakes would be made but you could pilot things you could do th things differently so my second piece the second skill set needed is to be a, a little more risk taking than 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 you've had in the past and then finally i do think in terms of hard skill uh, data and analytics is going to be usually important it doesn't matter which job you do in today's world but i think particularly if you're in reward and payroll where there's a mine of information if only you could use that in a different way if only you could get that and and therefore become you know the insightful leader that the rest of the hr team needs there's there's a real opportunity there so, so upskilling yourself around data and analytics would be the third thing Great. Thank you very much, Devyani. Now, we're going to run our second poll, but then I want to open the floor to um, deal with any questions that um, our audience have at the moment. So if there's something we've not talked about you would really like us to, now's the time to drop it into chat. But Devyani talked a little bit there about the use of AI and digital technology and its role as um, creating opportunities for H and HR and payroll system, um, professionals. So this is going to be our poll question then. So the question is this, do you see the use of AI and digital technology as an opportunity for HR and payroll teams? Answers are yes, definitely, maybe, no, or I'm unsure. So pick the answer closest to you. Don't worry, there's not going to be some pop quiz at the end or any explanation required. So do you see the use of AI and digital technologies as an opportunity for HR and payroll teams? Please um, enter your answers now. Sorry, forgot to hit the publish button. So let's just give that a moment. Daviani, whilst we do, let me come back to that bit about AI and data. Surely that isn't implying that we all have to become data scientists in order to be HR professionals. Yeah. I think that both you and Mandy would say, you know, the best systems actually offer a great deal in this space. No, absolutely. I mean, you know, it, 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 it's not about doing it, but it's being able to interpret uh, what's happening. And at this stage, I think of the HR function in many organizations to be proactive about using this opportunity and pushing it forward. You will always have the experts to help you, but I think your role is to say, I think in my area, I can play a very different role. The organization can benefit, HR can benefit. And so what do I need to do to bring that in rather than being a data scientist yourself? Yeah, and Mandy, from the systems point of view, it's the same thing, isn't it? There's an enormous amount of capability built into modern systems now that can give you these insights, surely. Oh, huge. Um, I mean, we we launched our first data and insight model probably 10 years ago. Um, and realistically, I think it was it was too soon. Um, I'm not sure sort of either the data was uh, in the system. And Deviani mentioned there's a very different skill set involved in actually taking data in a different way and looking at predictive data and data and insight and analytics and analyzing that than there is on pulling that together. Um, and so, so we've, we've been looking at a number of different ways because it's important to bring data from lots of different systems as well. So you can look at a broader picture. Um, but yeah, I think sort of the, the focus is very much moving into what does the data tell us and what does that mean we need to do within our business rather than spending days and weeks pulling data into spreadsheets and getting to the point where hopefully, cross your fingers, it balances across all systems. Um, but the capabilities, I, the, the amount of data and capability you can get out of payroll data alone is actually huge. But then when you add in potentially retail data, point of sale data, um, trend and sort of, um, calendar data, it, it's huge. Yeah, thank you very much, Mandy. And that's, I think, um, you, you talked there a little bit about um, the difference between reporting, and perhaps we'll come back and talk about this in just a moment, Yeah, what happened when, how much, um, and then beginning to get a bit diagnostic. Why did that happen? Is there an explanation we can see from there? So that is what story is the data telling us? 
So then when you start to become predictive, you start to look at, well, what's the story we want to be able to tell and what is the data informing us in that? And then, of course, ultimately, the, the best expression is, and how do we optimize all of this? So how do we optimize what everybody, all the stakeholders want out of that? Anyway, let's have a look at the poll. So how did we do? So did you see the use of age, um, AI and digital technology as an opportunity for HR and payroll teams? 58% uh, said yes, definitely. 41% said maybe. Nobody said no or unsure. So clearly there is an opportunity here. Um, let me just explore one of those things a little bit more. So um, we did talk about you know, um, the way that data is there and the reporting and the analytics. And I think you would have had to have been on Mars not to have seen the amount of attention that we've got about things like diversity and inclusion and equality. And we're going to be asked to report on this stuff. So, um, Mandy, let me come to you first. You know, th this is the kind of thing that I think for organizations like yours, this is something you can naturally do, isn't it? Once you make the transformation, you can begin to meet all of those compliance reporting requirements without adding massive amounts of workload onto the HR team. Uh, yeah, and I think there's two ways to look at it. There are obviously sort of some legislative um, and compliance reporting that people need to do, which, which yeah, fundamentally is within the system and it provides the reports that people need to do from a compliance point of view. But obviously there is then some different behavioural and trend data that organisations might want to look at. So you can slice the data in different ways to find out actually is is the issue within recruitment so are we not getting the right candidates through at that point or actually is the issue in a particular region or department that actually sort of could be a training issue in terms of um sort of bias in the recruitment process so i think that the actual legislative report is one thing but then how the business wants to put different initiatives around solving some of the problems they think they may have and changing culturally is then something that that the hr and payroll can now assist in great thanks um and this is the only same kind of thing you know once you start to have the data available it opens up all kinds of opportunities to what you can do with it um and i think uh, i think we've all heard the expression data is the new um black gold um, I actually don't think it is. I tend to think of data like clay. You know, it doesn't have much intrinsic value of itself, but if you make bricks, you can build anything else you like from it. So, you know, what perhaps for you has touched you as a great application where you've seen how the data has really been able to help a business on that journey of transformation. Maybe it's identified a new opportunity or an answer to a challenge that's bedeviled it for a while. Well, uh, you know, as I said, we have a couple of hundred of these solutions, and and I'm I never I never fail to get astonished by how effective they can be. Uh, just to go back to DNI, that's clearly a big big area of interest for many organizations, and they struggle and they struggle on several fronts. They don't know how well they're doing, so I think the benchmarking with other organizations' uh, information is missing. They don't know. You know which aspect of the people process should they focus on they don't know if they if they obviously there are issues but is the issue greater in the recruitment or as mandy said is it more when you bring talent in you're not really supporting them or is it you're not developing them or is it actually you're not paying them well so i think you know dni in general but if i look at the second big area of interest is employee engagement and gone are the days when employee engagement meant you do a survey and, 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 and of course, there are now HR teams that think just because the survey is not uh, on, you know, this, if it's done twice a year, they're doing better. But actually, in employee engagement needs to be measured constantly. And so a good use, uh, we've seen solutions, for example, that touch on five or six points of the employee from pre-boarding, onboarding, when they are in the organization, but even when they're off-boarding. And if you're able to assess employee engagement at each of those stages, you're not waiting for a person to resign. You're not waiting for six months to tell them how they are feeling. You are being proactive about getting information and employee engagement. So this is just one example. But I think the shift now is not to ask for information, but to use data analytics to get insights without going to an employee for information. And that can make a big, big change or a big shift into how proactive you can be in handling issues. Great, thanks very much, Devyani. And I think this is one of the areas where 
um, machine learning is really helpful, isn't it? It's being able to identify you know, what is normative, what is it that we think that um, everybody really values, but we also we can look at well, what do different um, people value out of this? What does the process contribute towards this one way or other? So um, then I'm just going to, to come back with uh, one final question for you each. Um, and Deviani, I'll go to you first. So yeah, we've, we've lived in a changing world, an incredible pace of change over the last two years, and we're still changing as we try to adapt to whatever the next normal will be for us. But what's exciting you about the future? So if you look ahead a year or so, you know, what, what are you excited about? What are you optimistic about in terms of um, within this field? So I think what is exciting is how data can now be linked. Let me give a simple example. Let's say culture. Now, culture is not, again, about an employee engagement survey, but today employees use Slack, email, and lots of different forms. And if you're able to take that data, create trends, and link that to how are people collaborating, how is the communication, how is the productivity, there's so much insight in there that can help business leaders in HR. So for me, the ability to, to link different forms of data and do it in a very quick and easy way is, is one of the real exciting things about the next couple of years. Great, thanks very much, Devyani. And Mandy, I know you've had a busy couple of years, um, but what's exciting you about the future? So looking ahead for the next 24 months or so, what are you really optimistic or anticipating? Uh -huh. Yeah, I think one is a little bit of a build on um, on Deviani's and it's just how technology can support the speed of change. I think sort of with the right technologies in place, the agility and speed of change is then exciting. Um, and the other key one for me is the employee experience. Having worked in payroll sort of for over 20 years, the employee part of payroll has for a long time been confined to a bit of paper at the end of the month, which is a payslip. Whereas I think sort of it's really exciting how much information, support, personalization we will be able to move to from an employee point of view um, as we move forward. Great. Thank you very much, Mandy. So what I'm going to do in the last few minutes then is, if you wouldn't mind, let me play back some of the things that I think I heard and you can tell me whether I've got any of them wrong. So clearly enormous changes um, structurally in many cases within the retail sector and a lot of that change is working its way down into HR and payroll. So for example we talked briefly about the war for talent. We're all chasing people to um, actually help us meet the demand as it comes back but those people are demanding different things. They want flexibility, they want more um, adaptation under their control. So we need to think about, well, what makes us the employee of choice, employer of choice rather, so that we can attract and retain and motivate those people as we all live fast paced, complicated lives. Now, the single biggest one I think that many people have experienced in retail is the change from the on the high street physical presence that many organizations shifted online and digital. And that experience has changed shopping behavior and the way that we live our lives and the way that we live our lives is coming back into the way that we work. So what we want from organizations. But there is a growing reliance on technology because it does offer some of the efficiency, some of the opportunities that would be very difficult to do by ripping up your entire operating model and recreating it with a new physical version of what you are. So we, we didn't talk a lot about that, but for many, it means a journey to the cloud. Now, the cloud means different things to different people. But one of the things it tends to mean for everybody is the ability to have an agile environment, which is also resilient. So you can build up um, that ability to deal with knocks and bumps, but also is scalable. So that as the economy opens up and as we all get back to shopping again, you're able to scale more quickly without having to just do that as a multiply the number of people to get there. But I think one of the things we talked about was that many of us have looked at our back office systems and then we look across at what we're offering on the front office, front of house systems and recognize there's an enormous disparity. That isn't new, that's been going on for quite some time, but our expectations have changed. And so we are now expecting to be able to self-service. Why do I need to fill in a piece of paper and send it to somebody to get my um, holiday approved? Why can't all that be digital? How can I um, look at the way I get paid and where I get paid into? All of these kinds of things 
this huge technology which is really beneficial to the employee but actually for the employer makes a lot of sense as well because many of those tasks are extremely time consuming and therefore expensive and we need HR professionals and payroll professionals to help with some of the bigger fornier problems are like how do we build a business for the future what are some of the things that are going to drive that so you know of course cost is always going to be a big issue for this but i think a lot of it is about technology as well and about the opportunity that it presents now you know i do remember the days when i used to get my pay slip in a little brown envelope and i would open it up and i could see how much i would get paid and as mandy you said that was a monthly experience um that was fit for purpose then. I'm not entirely convinced it's fit for purpose anymore. Firstly, because most of us actually don't use a lot of paper anymore. I get very little posts now. I'm used to be able to go onto an app, look at where things are, look at where I'm standing. You know, I can do my savings. I can do my banking. I can pay my bills. I can even tax and insure my car online with no paper at all. So why would I expect this to change? So, But it is a cultural change. You do need to bring the people with you. You can't impose it on them they actually have to see that there's a real benefit for them as well. Now, Debiana, you brought into the conversation AI and digital solutions. Incredibly exciting. Some of the things that we can do as, as we talked about, you know, firstly, we get a lot more data that we could actually access in very close to real time. So we don't have to wait weeks before we have data. As Mandy said, you know, it's two or three weeks, perhaps after we've closed the book on that month, but we can get insights much more quickly, which is absolutely what we need when we're in such a volatile world where changes are coming thick and fast and they're unpredictable. And we can't afford to wait a month before we get the data, before we can even start looking at, well, what did that data tell us about what's going on and why? And if we understand why, what would that mean if we begin to project that into the future? And better yet, what could it mean? So what value levers could we adjust that give us the best possible outcome for all of our stakeholders? And those stakeholders aren't simply the managers or the leaders of the business or the shareholders or the employees or the customers. There's a much wider remit now. We're seeing more legislation. We're seeing people paying a lot more attention to things like culture and governance and the way that businesses are run. So now is a good time to look at how do we combine HR systems and payroll systems, take advantage of some of this, because if for no other reason, some of those older systems, as more and more people transform away from them, the likelihood that you're gonna get long-term support begins to drop. And some of them are quite fragile. So perhaps now's the time to go for something a little bit more robust. It will need some more skills. It will need a different way of thinking. Um, that's not to say that we all become data scientists overnight, um, but we do need to get a, uh, to a point where we can understand what is the story that the data is telling us? What do we think it's meaning? And that's what a lot of business leaders are asking for. They're not asking for more data or more reports. What they want to know is what are my options and what are the reasons behind those? So what are the pros and cons? What are the impacts of these different choices I could take? And they're looking to us to help guide them through those decisions. So lots and lots that we've covered, lots and lots more we could. So what we're going to do is offer people on the webinar an opportunity to keep this conversation going one to one. So look out for that email. Not only will you get instructions on how to watch this back, but we'll give you a chance to talk to some of the best brains in the business. So do look out for that because I'm sure that in your environment, you've got questions you would have liked to have asked or there's something going on that you would like to drive to. But until then, all that really remains for me to do is firstly to thank our two experts. So thank you, Mandy, and thank you, Debiani. Wonderful, you've been really helpful. I've certainly taken a lot of notes. I want to thank SD Works for sponsorship of this webinar. It wouldn't happen without them. Or indeed, the Executive Leaders Network for doing the logistics and sorting out the platform. But last but by no means least, I want to thank all of you for your attention today. I hope you enjoyed it. But until the next time, thank you very much and take care now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.